Digital Audio Health by Cymatrax. Welcome to the Rhonda Grant Show with your host, Rhonda Grant. If you believe that there is more to life than what you see right now and you want to find out more, listen in as her guests share their journey and their extraordinary experiences. Now, here is your host, Rhonda Grant. Welcome to the Rhonda Grant Show. Sometimes the universe has a way of placing people or obstacles in your path to help guide and direct you on your mission. Listen in as we discover the path my guest has traveled. Has he been inspired by a calling, crafted his journey, or a bit of both? I invite you to embrace the conversations and to use them to see if this is happening in your life. Our guest today is Russell Targ. Russell studied graduate physics at Columbia University until 1956, when he left Columbia to work on the earliest development of the laser. He pursued laser research and development until 1972, when he co-founded the Stanford Research Institute program investigating psychic abilities. Working with great psychics, in Go Swan, he was able to teach many inexperienced people how to describe and experience events and objects in the distance and in the future. This ability became known as remote viewing. After a decade of highly classified research with the CIA, Targ left the Stargate program to return to laser research, which he pursued with Lockheed missiles in space until 1998. Welcome to the Rhonda Grant Show, Russell. I'm happy to be with you. I am so pleased that you've agreed to allow me to interview you. This is very, very exciting. As my first question, uh, well, what I'd like to talk about is you have um, a movie or a documentary, I should say, called Third Eye Spies. And can you tell the listeners when you uh, developed that movie? We made that two years ago. I was a producer of that film together with a very talented director, Lance Mangia. And I wanted to have a record of the remarkable work that we had done at Stanford Research Institute. And it was a time when the CIA contract monitors uh, had finally retired so they could talk on camera about what we had done. Before mm -hmm. that, these, these guys were both undercover and couldn't discuss it at all. So I was waiting to make a film until Ken Kress, who's a physicist, and Kit Green, who's a physician, both of them had retired from the CIA, and they agreed to be in the film. So the important thing, from my point of view, is that I was able to reenact a number of the remote viewing activities where we would describe where a person was hiding far away in the Pacific Ocean or in Russia or wherever they might be, be able to remote view, see them at a distance. And we had the CIA on camera saying, yes, we were there when Russ did that. And what he said is all true. So it's very hard in this world to get the CIA to stand on camera and testify to anything. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I had these two senior guys from the CIA said, you, we were there and it really happened. That made it worth making the film. So this is a two hour documentary that is now widely available. So if you just, it is available free on Amazon, but it's all over the place streaming. And it's called Third Eye Spies. Mm -hmm. And I saw that uh, documentary a few years ago, but when we had our talk the other day I decided to watch it again and boy I've learned a lot uh, from talking with you and also with Dean Radin and it was a different feeling uh, watching it and the people who were in it because I started to recognize those people can you talk about 
the stacked, I call them stacked synchronicities that had to happen for you to end up doing this research at, uh, that was under the, well, like a, cl- a classified program called Stargate. Well, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know wh- where you learned that it was full of synchronicities, but I was interested in psychic research, psychic abilities since I was a child. Mm-hmm. As a little, when I was a little boy, my father gave me a magic set with linking rings and uh, cups and balls and other way to fool. Children love to fool adults, of course. Yeah. And over those early years, I became very skillful. And when I moved to New York, I could buy magic paraphernalia from mm-hmm. the professional magic shops. So as a high school student, I was on stage uh, as a young magician, uh, entertaining audiences and fooling people. And I had the experience from time to time of having a visual image of the person whose mind I was pretending to read. Uh-huh. Now, I was pretending to read it because I had already, in advance, surreptitiously re- read the card she had filled out, but nobody knew that. But okay. sometimes I would get a picture of her house and her stairway and the bedroom and so forth, and I couldn't find her dog or whatever she's looking for, but I did have a pretty clear picture of what what where she really lived and that interested me as i learned there was a research into something called extrasensory perception mm-hmm. so i went from on stage fooling people to becoming a member of the american society for psychical research and became very familiar with the ongoing work at that time and i knew at that time that i wanted to do that research that kind of research because I already had a taste of what ESP was like. Mm-hmm. But from going to the meetings of, this, of the Parapsychology Association, there are a lot of very nice people doing research, and I loved the work they were doing, but none of them had any money. And I was a child of the Depression, of course. I grew mm-hmm. up in the 1930s. And uh, I, didn't want to, I didn't want to be poor. I, I knew what it was lo- like to not buy not be able to buy groceries. Mm -hmm. So I got my degree in physics and worked as a physicist as a pioneer in the development of the laser. Right. So that by 1972, I was really quite well known as a laser physicist. Right. And I thought that was a good time. I had just built a very large laser uh, breaking all the records in 1972. So I went to the CIA at, with a ESP teaching machine. I could take a time out right now and say, I have an ESP teaching machine called ESP Trainer that's available free from the Apple store. So if you, if you want to work with the thing, the device that got us started, that's available free. There's also one called Stargate Trainer. But and, I, and it's an app. It's an app that you can download on your phone. That's right. If and you... I have that app. Oh, good. Yes. What I find is that people call right to me and say they're getting better and better. Yes, you can. But I was interested in making the transition from laser physics to ESP research. But of course, there was no ESP research that paid anybody a living wage. So I had in my mind that I had to find a way to do that. And one day I was invited to give a lecture at Esalen Institute in Big Sur. And I did that together with a friend who was doing a workshop. And I talked about my experience with studying American and Soviet research. And I met the founder of Esalen named Mike Murphy. Yes, yes. Very fine fellow, Buddhist student. And we got along very well. The next day, Monday, he called me and said, I really like the talk you gave at Esalen, and I'm supposed to give a talk from my experience going to Russia with American and Soviet research, but I'm sick of the dog and I can't do that. Could you give my talk at Grace Cathedral? And I said, I'd be happy to do that tomorrow, and I'll do that. So I went to Grace Cathedral, and 
gave my talk on American and Soviet research. And a fellow came up to me and said, I liked your talk. My name is Art Reitz and I'm from NASA. I'm the new project administration and I'm having a conference on St. Simon's Island with pioneering physicists from all over the world. Would you like to come and tell them about um, what you know about Soviet American research? Just give the talk you gave here. So I went to St. Simon's Island with my ESP machine. So I wouldn't have gotten to St. Simon's Island if Mike Murphy hadn't gotten sick. Yes. I wouldn't have gotten St. Simon's Island if Art Reitz didn't stumble in the Greek Cathedral. Yes. At St. Simon's Island, I met Werner von Braun, the, American, the Russian, no, German rocket scientist who came to America and helped us build our initial rockets. And von Braun was interested in psychic ability, which nobody knew. And he did super successfully operating my ESP gadget. And each time he hit the correct button, the bell would ring and we drew a crowd. And I told him, well, I'm interested. The reason I brought my machine here is I'm interested in getting support from NASA to create a program to teach astronauts how to get in touch with their psychic ability. Now, I know that may sound like a crazy idea, but I, but I told him that was my goal. And I told him very persuasively. Yes. So Von Brown took me to the administrator of NASA, the top guy, James Fletcher. And Fletcher thought, well, that was an interesting idea. What makes you think that would work? And I said, well, I've published a paper showing that people could improve their ability. Okay. And he said, well, if you could get support, you can't do that in your basement with NASA support. But if you could get support at SRI, we might be able to support you. And at that moment, astronaut Edgar Mitchell walked by and said, I heard what you're talking about. And I've just started a program with SRI. I could set up a meeting with Russell and uh, the president of SRI, Charlie Anderson. And with the help of Edgar Mitchell, a week later, I got together with Charlie Anderson, Edgar Mitchell, a scientist who was already at SRI, Hal Putoff, interested in psychic ability. And Anderson agreed to let us start a program at SRI because we had support from NASA. So if I did not have this amazing mm -hmm. concatenation of yes. um, the the... the the, the sickness and uh, Art Reitz walking by and the all the people there to help me, one after the other, Mike Murphy and Von Braun and Edgar Mitchell, if all these people hadn't appeared on cue, there would mm -hmm. have been no program. So SRI would not support an ESP program. Yeah, but right. if NASA says, we'll give you $100,000 to start the program, it's like a farmer's market. If right. I show up at SRI with a program that will be supported by somebody, then I can do it there. And I did that for two decades. Right. Yeah, this was the stack synchronicity that I was talking about. And what, how many days or maybe hours, but uh, how long did it take for all of this to happen? From the time that Mike Murphy got sick, was sick and asked you to do the talk to the time that Edgar M Mitchell walked that in. Was, and, that was about two weeks. About two that, weeks. That, uh, uh, um, I, I agreed to give the talk to Mike, Mur for Mike Murphy on a Monday. Yes. A couple of days later, I met Hal Putoff from SRI and learned that he was interested in psychic stuff and was working at SRI. So we went from Mike Murphy to help put out Mike Murphy to Art Reitz the next day. Mm -hmm. Then Hal put off then Werner von Braun and the director of NASA and the astronaut. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah, Edgar Miss, uh, Mitchell is the astronaut. Astronaut. He was the sixth man on the moon, was he? I can't tell you that for sure. Yeah, I think he was around the sixth man on the moon. But I just find it fascinating that all of those things happened in a short period of time. 
And you ended up uh, one of, as one of the co-founders of the Stargate program that I'd like you to speak about. But well, we, we started the program mm-hmm. in September of 1972. And that program then went on for 20 years uh, teaching people how to get in touch with their psychic abilities. And we were also, that, that was the part I was interested in. Yeah. And we were also involved in doing operational things for the CIA. This find, finding kidnapped agents, investigating uh, Russian wep- wep- weapons factories, looking for submarines, we did all sorts of things on call for the CIA as we were trying to understand how psychic ability works. Right. And we then were able to publish our work in Nature magazine and in the proceedings of the Engineering Society in America. So we had the first ever pro- publications on ESP in either of those prestigious magazines. And so we, 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 so we, uh, Hal Potoff and I are both physicists. Right. So we're interested in, in, in how this works. So after two decades, we and many other people, this work has been replicated all over the world. The remote viewing is not just something that happened in California. Right. But many, many people have replicated this. And the thing that we know that's surprising is your ability to describe and experience what's going on in the distance is independent of how far away the object is. That is no harder to describe what's going on in Soviet Siberia, 6,000 miles from where I'm sitting, than it is to describe what's going on across the street. And it makes, and we published many, many papers showing that things we can describe what's happening two miles away at Stanford or 6,000 miles away in Russia. And the accuracy and the reliability is equal, independent of distance. And the other thing we descri- discovered is it's as easy to describe something in the future as it is a contemporaneous event. So we can look hours or days into the future and oh. describe what's going to happen. And we did that, one of our early experiments for the CIA, mm-hmm. they came into our lab and asked Ingo Swan, who's really the father of remote viewing. Ingo is the one who got us to quit looking at the object in the box. And he said, "I'm not, if I want to know what's in the box, I'll open the box. <laughs> I'm able to focus my attention anywhere on the planet. Right. So you guys are wasting my time. <laughs> it is a trivial, trivialization of my ability. Mm-hmm. And Ingo taught us that a very easy kind of psychic functioning is to have someone sit in the laboratory and guide them to describe where another person is hiding anywhere in the world. Mm-hmm. And of course, and that was my job. I don't drive because of my very bad vision, mm-hmm. but I <clears throat> became a professional interviewer for a decade. I would sit with you, for example, and say, okay, your, your friend Gail is off hiding somewhere. I have no idea where she could be. She could be <laughs> anywhere at all in California, north or south. Close your eyes and tell me about the surprising image you have. Where, where do you see Gail? And you say, oh, my God, I see it. She looks like she's sitting in an aluminum boat floating yeah. in the water. And then after the call that we have, you call her up and say, hi, Gail, where, where, where were you at 10 o'clock on Monday morning? He said, oh, I just launched my uh, houseboat out into the lake. Yeah. I said, well, I had a very good picture of you there. And that's what we did for a decade. I was I would sit with someone who said, I don't know how to do this. It doesn't make any sense. And I would say, that's all right. I just want you to tell me about your surprising mental images, what what pops into view. And with a little guidance uh, and an open mind, you can describe whatever it is you wanna be able to see. And we did that for two decades. Mm-hmm. It just, it sounds like it was a lot of fun as well. Well, I mean, it was quite serious. A lot of it was very, very serious, wasn't it? It's like psychic hide and go seek. Okay. 
Okay, it was so, serious. Yes, we at one point right. we were looking for Patricia Hurst. Yeah, and that was, that was a very serious undertaking. And Pat Price was able to turn the pages of a mug book at the police station. Mug book is like a big phone book, loosely phone book, with pictures of all the usual suspects who'd been arrested before. And he went page after page of this loose leaf binder on a big oak table. We're all hovering over him. Yes. And finally, he put his finger on the guy and said, that, that's the ringleader. And he put his finger on Donald DeVries. And in fact, Donald DeVries was the ringleader. So that's as close to a miracle as anything I've ever seen on the program, because no one knew the answer. Nobody, mm -hmm. nobody, nobody could whisper the answer to him. No. And he then told us where the car had where the kidnap car had gone. So he says a white station wagon by the side of the road across from a diner next to some white gas storage tanks. And the police sent a cruiser out to find that. They did find the car and it still had cartridges on the floor from the shootout at Patty Hearst's house. But of course the perpetrators were gone. Yeah. But we did indeed find the car. And we our, our organization got a commendation for the police department at Berkeley for, for helping them find Donald DeVries and for finding the kidnap car. Mm -hmm. So so it wasn't all uh psychic hide and go seek, though we did a lot of that as well. How long was she missed? Do you remember how long she was missing before she was found? Oh, she was gone for more than a year. Oh. Her her colleagues went to LA where the police burned them up in a cottage and she escaped with one other person and was taken to upstate New York. So she hid out in New York for almost a year. And then she went back to California and somebody turned her in. She went back to where she'd been staying. Obviously, a very bad idea. Mm -hmm. And the police just knocked on her door and said, we got you. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just incredible. And so the, the, uh, the words remote viewing, that was a better way to say precognition. Is that right? Well, Inga Swan gave us the term remote viewing. Okay. What, what we're doing was, that is, this is not new age. This was done by the fellow on my wall here, Padma Zimbabwe, yes. from the uh, 8th century. People understood that you could quiet your mind and see into the future. In the 19th century, this was called clairvoyance. Yes, which is and, and that's what J.B. Ryan called it, the ability to see something where no one knows the answer. It, reading somebody's mind would be called telepathy. Okay. So often, oftentimes, it's a mixture of clairvoyance and telepathy. Ingo Swan gave us the name remote viewing because we wanted to sound uh, more scientific than magical. Mm-hmm. Well, and yeah, because they didn't, they didn't want, uh, I would imagine that they didn't want those types of uh, words uh, being said uh, for the classified project that they That's had what going CIA on. didn't, didn't want to picture people sitting in a turban uh, floating in the <clears throat> air over his desk. Right. <laughs> That's right. And, and I taught many of the CIA people how to do remote viewing. So that when they went back to Washington, they would have their own experience of describing an experience, an experience where someone was hiding. See, I, 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 oftentimes people would come and say, show me something psychic. And what they meant is, uh, I'll go, someone will go hide and Ingo Swan will sit with you and me and describe where they are. And I said, well, that's what we do for the CIA. But if I did that for you, you would think it was some kind of trick or deception or that uh, they communicate with us. But if you have your own experience of describing where the person is, then you'll know that it's not a trick because mm -hmm. you'll know that you actually saw an experience where they were hiding and you have the drawing you made and the photograph that they took. So when you go back to Washington, 
So, well, so we would often have people come to our lab right up to the Undersecretary of Defense, where he wanted to see Ingo describe where someone was hiding. And I said, no, I'll, I'll just, this is very easy to do. All I want you to do is tell me about the, the pictures that show up in your awareness. Only you know that, so you can, we can't do it wrong. Just tell me what you're experiencing with regard to where your adjutant has gone with my partner and make a drawing of that and then we'll take you there. And, th and then we got our contract renewed. So that, that was what, so though each year we had to demonstrate again that ESP really works. Oh, okay. And we, and we would do that, not by showing them remote viewing, but by giving people the experience. So I've been away from SRI for about 50 years now. Okay. The next month, we're going to have a celebration of 50 years of remote viewing. Wow. And I've traveled all over the world doing workshops, showing rooms full of people how to do remote viewing in Scandinavian countries, England, Italy, France, and often through an interpreter, which makes it take a longer time. But people have no problem learning how to do this, often quite successfully. The most successful people were the Italian, the Italian women. They're, as a group, they're far and away the most successful of any, anyone that I encountered in my trip. Travels. Is that right? The Italian women? And I, I asked, my fourth year there, I asked a plenary session I have so you, you've seen me now for four years here, and, and you women are the most successful, much, much better than women in Silicon Valley or women in anywhere else they go. Why do you think that could be? And one of the women held up her hand and said, Well, everyone knows that the Italian women are the most sexy and the most beautiful. Why shouldn't they be the most psychic? <laughs> Perfect. And, and I concluded from that that what she's saying is that Italian women have the most self-esteem. Yes. And if there's something to be done, they'll be able to do it. Mm -hmm. But they were highly statistically, safe. if I want to get my PhD in remote viewing, I would have worked with those women because they were highly statistically significant year after year. It was quite, quite amazing. I was amazed. Mm -hmm. Well, it's something to be amazed about. I mean, it, for it sure. was like I was I was I was in I was in Sweden, I was in Norway, and then I went to Milan, and the Milanese women, this whole room full of stylish women in their short black dresses, it's as though they had a trick set up for me. But they were using my material, of course, but it's as though they could see right through the envelope. I mean, they were, it was really quite, I, I, after 10 years of remote viewing in the lab, these women blew me away. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so the more you do it, the better you get at it, I would imagine. That's right. That is, uh, pra practice certainly helps, but often people do the best thing they do the first time they try it. The first, right. the, the first timer effect. <clears throat> Many people learn to bowl. You hand them the ball, tell them what to do. They're a little shaky, and the first thing they do is bowl a strike. And they may not see another strike for their whole game. Mm -hmm. But uh, remote viewing is like that. Oftentimes, people will describe something super accurately on their first trial. And I take advantage of that. So when I have a government scientist or an administrator, I, I describe to him how remote viewing works, and I, I expect him to do excellently. And they, they, they generally do. They have a whole record of government scientists, top people who did very, very well in my lab. And what they would do well at is this high, psychic hide and go seek? Mm -hmm. The scientists would sit down with me and say, "I don't believe in this stuff." This was I was sorry, I'm going to tell you about a famous Israeli scientist named Yaakov Aranov. 
should get a Nobel Prize one of these days. And he was brought in because he was a well-known scientist, did not believe in ESP. And my partner and our laboratory director went to hide at some random place. And I told asked Aronoff to describe what he sees. He said, Russell, I don't know about you, but when I close my eyes, it's dark. Mm -hmm. And we did that for about 20 minutes. And I said, okay, uh, Yakif, uh, they're going to come back now. You've got to make some kind of drawing. Just pretend you see something. Just imagine that you see something. And he said, all I see is uh, my, my mother raises ducks in Israel. And all I see is this uh, duck farm. And I said, well, draw whatever you see. And he drew a little duck crossing the road. And where they had gone in Palo Alto was the Palo Alto duck pond down by the airport. So they, had, they came back with the photographs of ducks walking out of the duck pond. And we could hold that up next to the duck that he drew. So even though he didn't see anything when he closed his eyes, he was able to experience quite accurately where they were hiding. Mm. And that's what I did for a decade. Isn't that an interesting way to make a living? Yes, it's a fabulous way to make a living because it's so interesting. And you're meeting a lot of different types of people as well. And you're teaching a lot of people. I wish that I would have attended one of your workshops. Are you still giving workshops? No, I've pretty much uh, retired, <clears throat> retired from doing that. See, I will occasionally uh, give a lecture on remote viewing. Mm -hmm. but doing a workshop requires really an outpour of energy because you've oh, got to yes. sort of, you got to sort of, it's like a magic show. You've got to set the stage and hold yes. everybody's attention and create things so that everything is just so in the air, ready to go. And the remote viewer <clears throat> does not appear to be doing any, I misspoke. The interviewer does not appear to be doing anything, but he's creating the moment and holding the attention of the viewer. And that requires an output of energy that I often don't have. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, it takes a lot of energy to uh, run a, a program like that. That's Especially sure. if you got a big skeptical audience. Mm hmm well, and okay, so talk about that then. When you have a skeptical audience, is uh, is the energy different at the beginning of a workshop than it is at the end of the workshop once you've worked with these people and they they realize their own success? Sure. If this is a <clears throat> we say a weekend, make it easy for you. In Italy, it would be a week long workshop with an okay. with a translator. We'll make it easy as assume as a a weekend at Esalen, and by the time we've had uh, our first 90-minute session, everybody has seen something. So every, I, I promise people, <clears throat> I always upset Esalen or um, the management. I say, I'll promise you, you, you've all paid money to come here. I'll promise you that everybody will have either done something psychic or seen something psychic or will give you your money back. So I'm sure that it, what I'm basically betting is that half of the people will have done something psychic by the time we're done with our workshop. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. You're listening to the Rhonda Grant show right now, whose podcast has been treated with digital audio health by my sponsor, Simatrex. And I'm speaking today with Russell Targ, who is a physicist and, um, also teaches, has taught and studied remote viewing uh, for decades. And you have a website that you'd like to tell people about. I have a Russell. website called ESPresearch.com, which is a lot of pictures and videos from remote viewing that we've done all over the world with different people. So if you want to know what remote viewing is like, you can go to my workshop, ESP Research. And if you find it interesting, there's a link where you can send me correspondence. Mm, that's wonderful. Thank you. So in my show, I always ask if uh, my guests feel that they've been called to their work. Called or guided. 
Well, I've been interested in magic since childhood. My father had a bookshop in Chicago where he had books on mysticism, magic. Later, he published the biography of Madame uh, Blavatsky and Eileen Garrett. Oh, yes. Eileen Garrett's a famous American medium. And Helena Blavatsky had started the Theosophical Society and he was interested in magic, and I became interested in magic and proficient. Because every kid likes to be able to fool adults, and I did that through my young teenage years. I was doing magic on the stage, and as I mentioned before, and then I had experienced uh, psychic abilities w- folded in with the tricks that I was doing. So I became interested in magic. I I became interested in psychic abilities from having experienced psychic abilities as a teenager. Right. And then somebody put a deck of ESP cards in my hand, the circle, square, stars, and wavy lines from J.B. Ryan. And I began to read the parapsychological literature and I was hooked. I realized that there was another way of experiencing the world. See, because I have a very bad vision. Mm -hmm. So if there was another way of experiencing the world that hooked me, I thought that would be quite desirable. Mm -hmm. So although I I was a physicist for, after I left graduate school, I worked as a physicist for 15 years uh, in the beginning of the development of lasers. Yes. And by 1972, I was quite well known as a laser scientist, and I was then able to approach NASA and the CIA and get let them support our earlier work at Stanford Research Institute. Mm-hmm. But I got I got hooked in this uh, not from reading about it, but from doing it, and by experimenting. And, and the more you seem to get involved with it, the more you uncovered and the more things were solved in, in the world as well. That's right. I had built this ESP teaching machine in my 30s and published that. So I was convinced uh, that you could teach people how to be psychic. And then I brought that to NASA and Werner Ron Brown was able to be successful with that. And that got me started with my first financial support. Mm-hmm. What extraordinary discovery have you found? Well, most surprising thing that we found is that people were able to quiet their mind and describe and experience things that are happening anywhere in the world. And what's extraordinary is that that's independent of distance. So we modern physics has finally caught up with us. So what we're what mm-hmm. we have shown is that psychic functioning is a non-local ability. And the idea of non-locality yes. was first described by Schrodinger in the 1930s. He said this is a part, he said, this is the important aspect of quantum mechanics. He said 1932 and 19. 19- 35, Einstein wrote a paper yes. about uh, the fact that quantum mechanics, Einstein didn't like quantum mechanics. And he said quantum mechanics shows that there can be an interaction between things independent of distance, and that would violate relativity. And that uh, dysfunction existed for 30 years until people discovered that there were that it was true that for certain kinds of things, even in, in, in quantum mechanics and in remote viewing, the connection is independent of distance. A non-local connection pertains to the idea in physics that particles born together mm-hmm. still interact together. The yes. two particles are born together, they're, a physicist would say they're entangled as a term out of physics. Mm-hmm. And if you grab one of those entangled particles, it affects its twin. Yes. And this works with twin people, as you probably know. 
Mm -hmm. The twins who are born together often have similar surprise the aspects in their lives. So the and idea... even when they're separated and uh, they they end up living uh, the same sort of existence. That that's right. There, there are a lot of one of my friends, Guy Playfair, wrote a book called Twin Telepathy about a whole, he made a whole book of amazing coincidences between uh, twins who were separated. That's an interesting book called mm -hmm. Twin, Twin Telepathy that shows that uh, being born an identical twin gives you a person who will have a similar identity with you, just like a uh, a remote viewer and a distant person are connected and, and two elementary particles. So modern physics has finally caught up with the mystics. The, the idea of clairvoyance and uh, distant vision has been known for thousands of years. There are prophets in the Bible who are able mm -hmm. to quiet their mind mm -hmm. and see into the future. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then Cassandra has a similar misfortune of being uh, precognitive in Greek times. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the, the fortune telling of Chris, uh, of Greek mm -hmm. times has been uh, written down in many books. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I had uh, one of the most uh, important, I guess, uh, precognitive um, feeling that I had or seeing into the distance, didn't know what it was because it was back in uh, 1986. And it was after the birth of my son. And he was laying in the bassinet in the hospital room. It was back when you stayed in the hospital for five days after you gave birth. And I was looking out the window and all of a sudden, what came over me was that I was in a different hospital, in a different city, and there was a different baby in the bassinet. And the last thing I wanted to do was to have another baby. I just had one, <laughs> right? And, and, and it came like that, and it was gone. And four and a half years later, I delivered my daughter in a different city. And it wasn't until just before her birth or after her birth that I realized that I'd re or sorry, I remembered that I'd had that intuition or distance dreaming, right? That sounds like a precognition to me. A precognition? The, 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 you, you were all queued up in this unusual suspenseful state. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you're future baby triggered that event you're able to see see that in the future oh i would i would say you can't prove that but just from the way you describe that yeah uh, i i would agree with you that that's probably a precognitive event mm -hmm. and 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 since then i've had many of them but uh as well as precognitive dreaming where you dream something and precognitive tell dream. Me. Precognitive yeah. pre pre dreams is the first event that many people have in the world of psychic functioning. Okay. Precognitive pre dreams should be encouraged uh, because they're, when you're asleep, you have given up all your inhibitions to being psychic. Uh -huh. So you're open to the experience that you're going to have at a later time. In fact, Having a dream about what's going to happen to you the next day is the most common of all psychic experiences. That, wow. that, fre that frequently happens to me where I will have a dream and then on awakening, I will tell my wife, if it's a precognitive dream, I'll tell my wife about it. Because you, you don't get credit for precognitive dream unless After. you tell somebody about it. Right. What happens with time? Like if I'm dream, if I dreamt something last night, which I did, and I usually don't remember my dreams, but I remember two last night. And so what happens with time? How is it that you're, uh, you're able to, as Gary Lockman's new book out, uh, dream ahead of time. So dreaming ahead of an event. Uh, how do you explain that? Well, we live in a 
surprisingly interconnected world. Those we live in a world which is um, which is complex. That is to say, there is are ways to from any point in space time where you're located, there will be a path through space time to a distant point in space time. And that can be a point that's distant in time or mm -hmm. distance in the future. Mm -hmm. And because the world is space time, you can find a path, not, not all paths, but if you quiet your mind, you can find a path between you here and now Mm -hmm. and look for you in the future at some distant place at some distant time see from a physicist's point of view you just say here you are you have some coordinates called monday morning at 10 o'clock right and you want and you want to look at some other point like you at the same location uh tuesday morning at 10 o'clock those are just two coordinates in space time. From a physicist's point of view, mm -hmm. you have a set of coordinates describing where you are now, which are X, Y, Z time and space where you are now, and X, Y, Z time, uh, some later time. And there will be a path from you right now through space time to that distant place. And if you're able to quiet your mind, you can go from where you are now to some future point. You can't take your body with you, but you can take your time, your co consciousness with you. Consciousness. <laughs> the, the Buddhists knew uh, 2,500 years ago that there's no separation consciousness. The Buddha, in his ma major work, the Prajnaparamita, he said that there was no separation for consciousness. The separation is an illusion. And that's what we found. The separation is an illusion. That you are able to see and experience what's going on in the distance and what's going on in the future. Is an illusion? No, it's not an illusion. You're it's able not to an illusion. You are able to... For example, to... I, I, I had a... Oh, I, I had a lot of precognitive dream. I had a precognitive dream once of I dreamt that there was an electric train running around the ceiling in my living room. And I don't have an electric train anymore. Mm -hmm. But I told my wife about this. And she said, that's pretty unusual because I saw the, lo the locomotive and all the cars and so forth. And then I grabbed my coffee, turned on my computer. And the New York Times is my homepage. The New York Times showed up. And I could ask, what do you think of the front page of the New York Times? And the answer is, it's the reconstruction of the elevated in Chicago where I grew up. And the elevated in downtown Chicago is called the Loop mm -hmm. because the train from the north side and the south side goes in a loop where they can change cars. My father's right. bookshore was right there. Ah. They had a picture of this looping electric train up in the sky was the front page picture of the New York Times. Wow. So that, that was my that fit perfectly into the dream that I had three hours before. Mm -hmm. And just showed up on my screen here. And that, that is a, not frequent would be an overstatement, but that happened many times where I have a dream and then I come and get to see it uh, on my television screen, uh, on my office computer. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just, I'm so fascinated with the subject. And I think that's why I love to talk to people like you, because, I mean, you did this for a living, and I went and did a whole bunch of other things, right? But here we okay. are talking about one of the most fascinating uh, subjects to me in the world is because there's a mystery to it. So I encourage you to find a partner to work with. Mm -hmm. Your partner will have a little object in a bag for you. In the beginning, she will know what's in the bag and, and she'll say, do you, I have this object here. 
tell me the surprising thing that I'm going to show you in a little while. Yes. You can learn to do that. And then after a little while, a few days, uh, she'll bring three bags and then stir them up and say, here's a bag. There's some interesting object in it. I do not know what it is, but we'll learn together when I open it and tell me about it. And the reason you want to do that is if each day your friend knows what's in the bag, what you will teach yourself to do is to read her mind. Read her mind, right. And okay. you don't want to, your purpose is not to teach yourself to be telepathic with your girlfriend, but you would like to open your mind to be clairvoyant to the world at large. So that, that's why she has, you, you start, you want to start out with all the roads of success available. That you have the mind to mind connection with your friend, you have the clairvoyant connection with the object, and you're going to see the object, which means you have a precognition. There's the, probably the most open channel is where you say, Tell me what I'm going to have in my hand five minutes from now, and just experience now what you're going to have in your hand in five minutes. So you've got a clairvoyant channel, a precognitive channel, mm -hmm. and a clairvoyant channel all available in the beginning. And you want to learn how to cultivate this precognitive channel. Mm -hmm. And you can do that by just practicing with a friend. Right. So I, I, I encourage you to do that. And I wish you success with your remote viewing experience. Thank you. Well, I know what I'm looking for because I have had some experience with it. So that's that's the good thing. So it's just a matter of developing it further, right? Yeah, people yeah, often find the greatest use for clairvoyant ability is to find something that they lost. That oh, I, yes. I, 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 I've, I've <laughs> like lost, my phone. <laughs> I, I've lost my diamond bracelet. Can you help me yes. find that? And I've, right? just, I've written a brand new book, which will be out in the spring called Third Eye Spies. Yes. Describes how I got into remote viewing and how you can learn to do it. Well, I'm looking forward to it. And so I have your Limitless Mind, which is in audio. Do you think you'll have any of other of your books in audio? I don't know that's out of my control. I'm is oh, it's out of I, your control, of course. Yes. Right. I, I'm glad you're enjoying that book. I love it. Yes, I really do. I'm not quite finished it, but I, I, I just love what you're teaching. I mean, you're a great teacher. And uh, for we students who are hungry uh, for this uh, type of uh, material, it's, uh, it's wonderful. Thank you. Well, the book that has all the pictures from my classified program is called Reality of ESP. And that is available now. Okay. And that's a I have a section telling you how to learn remote viewing and all of our classified pictures are now spread out there, declassified. So you can see uh, the accuracy and reliability that we had in our CIA program. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm very happy to chat with you. Thank you. We'll chat soon, I hope. Right. Good. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Theme song for the Rhonda Grant show, Sun on the Water, is composed and performed by my friend John Park Wheeler. This is Rhonda Grant with the Rhonda Grant show, author of Magical Forces Within, Extraordinary Discoveries in an Ordinary Life, inviting you to look for the magical forces within yourself today and every day. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in to the Rhonda Grant show with your host, Rhonda Grant. If you would like to find out more information about Rhonda and her upcoming guests and the work that she does, go to her website, rondagrantauthor.com. That's rondagrantauthor.com. Digital Audio Health by Cymatrax.